<laughs> Welcome back, everybody, to the ROI Online Podcast. And today I'm excited to introduce you to Cody Music. This is someone you need to know. He's, um, um, we would have said he was a current client of ours, but he's in a transition period. But we've uh, had this conversation scheduled for a while and we're running with it because um, I just enjoy him and we have an excellent conversation. So Cody, welcome to the ROI online podcast. Hi, Steve. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having me this morning. And, you know, we have been talking about this for a while, so it's, I'm excited to finally get this conversation going. Yeah. So Cody, uh, in this conversation, the folks that listen to it, that we have story brand guides, we have entrepreneurs, we have uh, business leaders, marketing directors. And so the, the conversations that we have during this time are conversations, you know, that time that you talk to someone and you maybe you were somewhere and you didn't expect to have this little conversation with someone that actually understood this little thing that you wrestled with and no one else was and you, you felt like, oh my gosh, you, you, you go through this too? You mean I'm not crazy? And so that's what the conversations here are to help our winners, our leaders to not feel crazy. Because sometimes we do, we feel alone, we wrestle with stuff. So it's nice to know that other people um, go through those things. So yeah, hundred percent, 100%. 100%. So Cody, tell us a little bit about your backstory. Where, where did you grow up? How did you get to where you are right now? Oh, so I, I grew up in a, a little community in central Texas uh, called Blanket. And it's, I mean, it's tiny, 600, 600 people. And it's spelled just like it sounds like, you know, a warm blanket, right? So uh, that's the, the community I grew up in. Uh, really small, little, you know, like any, like in most of Texas, a little football town, right? So six man football, if you've never heard of that, look it up. That's yeah. a whole different, whole different uh, strand of football. Um, so I, I grew up, uh, we did, uh, my dad was a, a dirt work. He did, you know, dozers. Uh, we did a lot of farm and ranch work, you know, a lot of stock tanks and ranch roads. And that's the kind of work I grew up doing was operating machinery. And um, so Right out of right out of high school, uh, I got an associate's uh, there, Brownwood local uh, town, and then uh, a year and a half later, I moved to the, the big city. I moved to Fort Worth, Texas, and started started my career there, and um, got to got to work with some really great engineers there. A little a little engineering company it was uh, I attribute you know, where I'm at now to some mentoring I got at uh, Frank W. Neal and Associates, a little engineering company in Fort Worth. Um, they inspired me to, uh, actually what they did was they, they uh, gave me a, a wake up call. They took the blinders off to the fact that um, I wanted to pursue engineering and surveying. And that was something that had kind of been stirred up in me while, while I was there. And yeah, they just had the hard truth conversation with me. They were all licensed engineers. They had their masters, they were licensed. And they just said, look, you know, you're, you're young, you're bright, you're talented, but you said, you're going to hit the glass ceiling in this industry if you don't go back to school. So, um, so off I went, uh, I was 20, I, I was a late bloomer. I, uh, I went to school part-time at night and worked full-time and got all my calculus and physics and all that out of the way while I was working full time. And, and then, uh, 2008, I, I moved to Corpus Christi and went to, went and finished my bachelor's in science at A&M Corpus Christi, uh, focused in geomatics and, and GIS. So for geomatics is just the mathematical term for, uh, spatial science or Yuck. land yeah. in, in, in the state of Texas, land surveying. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, got, uh, treated my bachelor's degree like a job for two years, really hit it hard and um, was really fortunate to to land a, a job in 2010. You know, of course, you know, 08, 2010, we all know what happened then in the housing market, but uh, just economic bust in general. But I found a great job right out of college and uh, in the oil and gas surveying uh, field. And um, 
with topographic and they took me in and, and trained me and you know, had some great leadership there. And, um, four or five years later, I had an opportunity to move to San Antonio area to the hill country, uh, Bernie, where, where I live now. And, um, eventually, uh, started, started working as a, a partner at open range field services, which is, you know, surveying and surveying and mapping in the oil and gas industry. That's a beautiful part of Texas. Why did, why did you have this uh, interest in surveying? What, what, what's going on? Is that a cat well, in the background, I, by the way? Because this is a second cameo I've had with a cat. Uh, no, I, you, hear, you hear a little sound? Uh-huh. I think that's our chickens balking. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we've got 14 chickens. So that's, that's, been, the, uh, that's been the positive outcome of, of COVID is we, uh, we decided we wanted chickens for a long time. And we've got a house and five acres here where we're at. And we're like, okay, this is the time. We're getting some chickens. No, so funny. that's probably what you hear is some chickens balking it's, in the background. No, it's funny. I've had cameo appearances by cats, dogs, kids. And this is the first time that we've had chickens <laughs> on well, the ROI online podcast. You well, can you get go. chickens. Yeah, I'm in the office. I guess she's uh, one of those hens must be really upset about something. That's funny. <laughs> so what, what got you fired up about engineering? Um, well, I, I remember very specifically the moment I, I made this shift from engineering to surveying. I was working at that engineering firm in Fort Worth and I was doing a lot of, I was working with the, the engineer, the vice president of that little company, and uh, he did all their bridge design and civil, civil, all civil structures, we'll, we'll call it. And I remember working on a project and I found myself completely intrigued and, and, and almost distracted with working with the survey data and the map and, and, and the aerial imagery. And so just working with all these survey tools and, and information associated to the engineering of this bridge and, and I realized I was like I care a lot more I find a lot more interest in uh, in the surveying and the, the mapping side of this and I do the engineering side so I realized well I'm going down the wrong road like I, I need to switch gears I was focused on civil engineering and I realized like I want to I want to be a surveyor I want to I want to be in the, the mapping side of the world so I, I made that switch like that semester. I, I started doing a lot of research and uh, it turns out that at the time, Texas A&M Corpus Christi was, uh, was one of the only uh, accredited four-year bachelor's science uh, surveying degree that you could get in the nation. And it was the only one in Texas at the time that was accredited and that was recognized by the engineering boards and, and everything else. So uh, off I went and uh, it, it put me on a fast track to getting my license. Um, you know, I remember I got my license in, uh, in, in 2013 and uh, I was a fairly good student and studied hard and, and I got my license and I got it probably faster than I, I should have. <laughs> and I remember getting my license and going, oh man, I'm dangerous. <laughs> so I still had a lot to learn uh, and I had some good mentors, but so that's how I ended up in surveying. So what's different about surveying now compared to when you started it? Obviously, or I wouldn't, I mean, it's not just the guy standing there on the, I always see them with, they got the little tripod and they're mm -hmm. looking through the thing and I'm wondering where's the other guy or what, what's going on? Yeah. There? Well, and, and the, general pub, the general public thinks it's a big camera. They'll be like, are you the guys taking pictures over there? And it's like, or well, Google? we're not, yeah. we're not taking pictures. We're taking extremely precise measurements. <laughs> but, um, I think just, uh, I think access to public data is one of the things that has probably, um, changed our industry the most, you know, you've got, you know, Google earth and Bing and, and then you've got, all these data sets that, you know, the tax, essentially the tax basis creates, you know, with, N with the uh, NCR and with uh, USGS, uh, US Geological Survey, uh, NOAA. So there's all these just data sets that surveyors have access to that we really didn't have uh, even 20 years ago. So that, that's one of the things that's really changed is the, the access to all these different data sets to solve uh, that just give you clues into solving some surveying and mapping specific problems. So I think access to data, uh, you know, the GPS has been, was, was pretty pivotal uh, in, 
in the development of the survey industry. You know, we went from all stationary measurement machines, optical laser type measurement devices that, and then, you know, when GPS really got going and got refined, it totally changed the surveying industry. Uh, and so I think the third generation of that big shift from, from physical measurement to, to G GPS measurement, and then access to all these big public data sets that the government helps produce. Um, it's one of the, one of the, one of the benefits of our tax dollars is, is that data. So. What kind of problems are you solving? Uh, well, you know, we focused a lot. On, I've been focused the last 10 years, uh, specifically oil and gas surveying has been where I spent most of my time. And a lot of that uh, in a very controversial area, which is uh, pipeline construction, you know, so depending on where you're at, uh, you, you may be the beneficiary or you may, uh, but not be benefiting by the construction of a pipeline. But so right I, I've spent a lot of time in, in right away development. Mm -hmm. So where's the pipeline going to go, you know, learning how they build pipelines and, you know, to, to be a good surveyor in the, in the oil and gas field, especially in pipeline, uh, you really have to understand how they build it you know, or else you can't, you can't really support your customers. Uh, if you don't understand the problems they face in building a pipeline, well then you can't effectively route the pipeline for them. So I think that's one of the biggest problems we solve is we take all these different data sets, some that we collect and some that are available, you know, through other resources. And then we start really uh, refining, you know, where's, where's a constructible route that uh, is amenable to the landowners that, that want to work with these energy companies. And um, then we just, that's what we do is we, you know, we take, you know, Texas especially is uh, from a land right perspective, it's a jigsaw puzzle and yeah. most of the puzzle pieces don't fit. So there's the element of trying to get these property boundaries and, and title to, to, to be in agreement. And then you, then you're trying to route a pipeline through it. So there's, it's multi-layered uh, challenge when you start talking about developing a right of way. It's crazy. I, you know, when I'm in a plane flying over parts of Texas and you look down and you see, you see the water wells, uh -huh. right? Then you see the oil wells, you see the, the turbines, the wind turbines, and you think of all those lines and pipes and things running all over the place in yep. different layers. And I'm going, how do they keep track of all that? And, and there must be all this um, mess that, that people have to clean up, not in, not necessarily a, a spill mess, but an entangling mess of pipes and yeah. wires and stuff. How does that happen? Well, I mean, part of it is they, uh, that, that's, that's part of our job as, as surveyors when we work for these, you know, whatever the company is, whether it's the wind turbine folks or if it's the, in the energy sector for, you know, maybe it's an exploration company that's, that's drilling a well, maybe it's a pipeline company, maybe it's the utility company that's putting in the infrastructure to support it from, from electric power. Um, you know, you got all these, and you got uh, saltwater disposal lines, you got fresh water, you know, so there's a, yeah, there's a, there's a spaghetti bowl of, mm -hmm. of infrastructure under the dirt you see. And over time, it gets harder to find those clues, right? Because mother nature does what she does. She, you know, she repairs herself, you know, the dirt, the grass grows back a lot of the times. Um, and so those, the, the maps become even more uh, valuable over time as the physical evidence uh, kind of gets harder to find that those maps uh, become super critical. Uh, so that's where the role of the surveyor and the mapping professionals come in and all those industries is we collect the data and then uh, hopefully it's stewarded well over time so that people have access to it. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of how you start putting those puzzle pieces together as you start literally stacking data. And then you get this, this mosaic of information, you know, you've got, you know, with the wind turbines, for example, you know, there's high voltage uh, underground electric transmission lines, right? That, right? that are running through there and they're an electric pipeline for all intent and purposes. Yeah. And so, you know, if you're going to build a pipeline in, in an area where they've developed wind turbines, you, you better know where that stuff's at because that's going to be a real problem if you, you know, if someone, strikes that electric line right so um 
it, it's an interesting problem. And I think that's one of the reasons why I was kind of drawn to that is, um, you know, there's, it's kind of a high pressure and I, I, I tend to, and when I get in a project, I, I like to, to, to move with it. Right. So, um, and then you, you get this stacking of data. So it's really this, this puzzle to be put together. And I think that's what always intrigued me. So here you are, you're, you mature in this expertise and, and you're working for the company that you're working for when I met you and you get handed an assignment to also to work on the marketing. That's why yeah. in the world, why in the world does that get delegated to you when it's like the nothing that you train for, right? And it's, <laughs> right. you talk about another mystery on the mosaic. Why did you end up with this responsibility? Well, I think it's because I had an interest in it. I, I'm, I am uh, perpetually curious. Uh, I think that's a, a blessing and a curse, right? Like I'm, I'm always wanting, always learn something new. You know, I've always, I've always got a podcast on, you know, in the background, you know, if I get in the truck and drive four hours, I don't listen to the radio anymore. I listen to an audio book or a podcast, you know, mm -hmm. like I'm constantly feeding myself. But, um, I think, you know, about, um, golly, about 12 years ago, I think I started 10 really, I really started tuning in to what other leaders were doing and, and just, I really started developing this professional curiosity. It's like, okay, like I know I'm going to be a surveyor all my life. You know, I'll always be a licensed surveyor now. Like that's, that's in, you know, galvanized into my identity a little bit specifically in my career, but I didn't want to be a one man show and I didn't want to be a, you know, whatever, a one trick pony. Right. So I wanted to be a professional. And so I started learning, listening to other leaders and, and learning other elements of business. And then um, somewhere along the way, I stumbled across uh, Donald Miller and, and story brand. Mm -hmm. And uh, I took a marketing class in college, you know, about 2008, 2009. And uh, honestly, I, I, don't, I don't know that I learned anything from it. You know, it seemed like it was a little stagnant at that time. And that was 11 years ago. So uh, a few years back, I stumbled across story brand and, and this idea of taking your marketing and really connecting it to a story. And then not only that, but becoming, becoming the guide and not the hero. Cause so many brands and so many things that you're sold, you know, I, I can't tell you how many junk emails I get with, um, you know, the whole, the whole pitch is let me be the hero and, and solve all your problems. I was like, well, I didn't really know I had a problem. <laughs> so I don't need a hero if I don't have a problem. <laughs> So, um, so I, I think that approach really intrigued me and it, it got my attention and I really started getting curious and just dug into it. And the more I did, the more interest I got. And the more I realized, you know, our company, um, uh, we were just grassroots startup. I mean, bare bones, no frills, but we had talent. Like we had some really good people that were good at their jobs and, um, and that's really, that was, that was it. That was our marketing was just word of mouth. We're going to, mm -hmm. we're going to do what we say we're going to do and we're going to, we're going to produce good work and we're going to show up on time. And, but somewhere along the way we grew and we grew quickly. And I realized, I don't know, about two years ago, like we, we have to grow up in our image and branding and marketing and content as well, you know, cause we, we could go to a meeting and we're all, we, we all, um, had the same um, philosophy about our company, but how we spoke, how we, how we communicated that was we were with four different companies when it comes to how we sell our company yeah. or how we brand or market our company. So I realized we needed some help and, and I didn't have the expertise to do it myself. So that, that's how I, essentially I went to the, the, the other partners and said, look, I'll, I'll take this on because it needs done and I'm curious and I'm willing to, to suffer the learning curve to, to get it done. And so off we went. Let's think about that conversation that you had with the partners. Now here's make fun of Texas a little bit. Here's the company in, in rural Texas, right? Uh -huh. That's been successful. That's got a bunch of Texas boys that yep. have been running this business. They're good business people. They know their stuff and they've gotten, they've, 
they've been successful without a uh, necessary nod to marketing or an expectation of marketing or any of that. Why in the world? And then on top of engineering and surveying, why do you even need to consider marketing at, at, at that time? That's really fascinating to me because most, most people go, well, you don't need to have marketing for a surveying company. Or, yeah, why would right? you? Why? So what is wrong with you, Cody, that you would walk in and risk your, you know, the, the stock value you have as a valued team member and bring up a, a crazy topic of marketing when in their heads they're thinking, oh, you want to hire someone to do our social media? I'm not even on Facebook. That, right? <laughs> so... So what ha one of the things that happened that um, that kind of solidified our need to to grow up, you know, for lack of better words, uh, to mature uh, as a company in our, our marketing and branding, was um, we were we were competing at that about 2017 2018. I mean, we were competing with with some national firms for projects. I mean, we were we were going after some big projects. You know, we were the David and a Goliath industry at that point. You know, the there were some really big firms that we were competing against, and we were competing quite well. Um, but one of our customers, uh, you know, kind of friend to friend on the side, you know, told one of our partners, he said, look, here's the deal. Um, you're going after this project, and you want to get in, and you want to run with the big boys. But the problem is, is when we sit around – our, our board of uh, directors and, and, you know, we, we sit down as an energy company and we're talking about these big strategic projects and the contractors and vendors that might be good to partner with, uh, because at that point you become a stakeholder in their project, you know? Mm -hmm. So when they look at stakeholders in their projects, um, we were competing with people that had done their homework and they had done the legwork mm -hmm. for branding and imaging and content and speak and, you know, when they show up on the job site, they, they, they had a nice well-branded truck and their shirts all look the same. And um, so the perception was exactly what we had become. We were a small, you know, we were, we were like, uh, you know, the, I don't know, the rebels really, you know, like, yeah, we were the misfits a little bit, but we were good and we were effective and disruptive, but we didn't look the part, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when, when, when those uh, energy companies are sitting and looking at their projects and they say, well, we've got company A, B, and C, national level firms, well-branded, well-marketed. They all had business development guys that, you know, they were all, you know, they were in their face constantly. Um, we, we just could not compete from an image and perspective. Like they, they, we were just outclassed, honestly, in, in that area. Now, Never mind the fact that we actually did better work than they did. And we actually gave our customers a, a better uh, customer experience because, you know, we were personal and nimble, agile for all intent and purposes, but we didn't look the part and we were missing out on opportunities because of that. So you, you went and did a little um, study and you found us and you probably talked to some other folks. Yep. Your expectation at that point was probably X, but now on this side of, of that decision, talk to us about how your, what, what you perceived you needed before the engagement with us, and now what you understand really was the real value, the real thing that you needed. The, the problem you discerned, or I just talked about, right, was mm -hmm. X. But the real problem you needed to know about was different. Well, I think for, I, fortunately for me, personally speaking, I think I had some realistic, uh, a little bit of an awakening and a realistic expectation uh, going into my engagement with, with ROI online. Mm -hmm. And um, because I had read, you know, um, the book, you know, Donald Miller's story brand book, mm -hmm. I realized okay, I'm in way over my head. Like I understand the why behind everything in that framework and in story-based marketing. I understood the why, but 
the how I was, you know, it's, it, it was impossible. And I was, you know, working 50, 60 hours a week at that time. I was like, I, I don't have time to do this, you know, organically myself. There's no way. And so uh, when I looked at that, I was like, okay, I need a guide. Like, it's obvious, like, this is, this is outside of my area of expertise. You know, I've got a bachelor's in science and, and GIS and, and surveying, and this is marketing. Uh, it's totally, totally different animals. So um, I, I just knew, you know, that I was, I was going to need help. And, uh, and you guys, you know, fortunately for you, your Texas based company, uh, that voted well with, you know, some of the people and in influence in our company that we needed to, uh, to get buy-in to get funding for this project. And, uh, and, you know, our corporate office was in Pampa, which is a little, little community, I don't know, 20,000 people, uh, you know, 45 minutes east of Amarillo, you guys are Amarillo based. That's where your address is at anyways. <laughs> um, so, you know, geographically, you know, it kind of culturally it, it uh, you guys became a, a good option for us. And, uh, and then I, I had a conversation with you and, and that kind of sealed the deal. Uh, I feel like you understood exactly where we were at and where we needed to go. And, uh, so there's a little bit of risk associated with this decision because, it, this was your initiative that you brought to your team. Mm -hmm. So the risk of picking an agency or a designer or whatever that might become a dud would have, would have hurt your stock value. So to yeah, be, for sure. For sure. Talk about that. Well, you know, I think that's pretty much where uh, that was kind of the line in the sand was I just had to take you know ownership of it and just to look if this thing flops, then, you know, it's on me, you know, take it, take it out of my profit sharing at the end of the year, if it doesn't work, you know, like it would just, I, I felt that confident that, that it was the right move. And that's just part of being an entrepreneur too, right? Mm -hmm. Like you, you have to take risk, you know, yeah, and calculated risk, right? You don't want to be reckless. You know, this, this wasn't a reckless uh, engagement or investment in the company. You know, I'd done several years worth of homework. I'd, you know, I, I'd, i have done as much homework as I could. And at some point you have to be inclined to action, right? You can study, 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 but you're not going to learn until you engage it. Right. So, right. um, so yeah, it was a risk, um, to some extent, but it was a risk worth taking. And, um, you know, if, if, it, if it just was awful, then, you know, we would have at least ended up with a, a you know, a, a pretty picture on the web, on the, on the mm -hmm. internet for our, our website right so mm -hmm. but there was so much more to this than 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 just a, a crisp looking website right so that was that's just a derivative of good marketing and that's what i've learned is um you know if you go through a good marketing process a website just is, is just an output of that work so yeah. so you know if we apply the the story brand framework to of the conversation or the situation that you were in one thing that's very important during this engagement is that you have the, um, the data, so to speak, the collateral, the things that you can communicate accountability to your team as you go through the, the project with us, right? And yep. so that's built into the process. Where did that empower you and how did... I would love, I, and I still don't know, and it, it, that may not be an answer that you have, but I'd love to know how your team warmed up over time to what you were implementing. Uh, so it was a slow process for sure, because um, it was, it's a bit foreign to, to this team. Um, so it, it's taken some time, um, and it kind of depends on, I think, how kind of how how much you keep up with with industry or with trends and i i tend to try to stay kind of plugged into that i i'm 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 a i'm a weird kind of guy like i'm i'm a country guy in my heart but i also you know keep up with you know a lot of things that are just culturally trending and and look at try to keep up with you know, how that impacts you know the business we're in and the, and the, especially the industry that we work in and cause you gotta stay relevant. And I think that's the whole, the whole point of why my curiosity served well in that area was, you know, just trying to stay relevant um, to, to the market. And one of the things that, that's, that are, and I'll kind of 
I may go a little off script here, but I'll, I want to chase this rabbit a little bit if you'll yeah. entertain me is one of the things that we realized in our industry, especially in the oil and gas industry was that the, the project managers inside of those, the, the influencers, the decision makers inside of those energy companies. When I started in the oil and gas business 10 years ago, most of them were very experienced 20, 30, 40 years of experience in the industry. Uh, really they, you know, um, kind of baby boomers for all intent and purposes. Mm -hmm. And that's the guys that were making the decisions. And so everything, so there was a lot of things that they didn't care about. Uh, they just, they, they wanted you to show up, get your work done, no frills, you know, and, but as the demographic demographics have changed in, in the, in the energy side where younger project managers are stepping up and taking over those responsibilities as those guys kind of exit the industry. Um, you, you have to speak a different language uh, to get, to keep confidence and to stay relevant and the, to give them, you know, to, to be able to communicate with them in a way that is, they're receptive to. And I would, I am in that, that age group, you know, I'm in that demographic with those, those leaders that were stepping up and I was kind of trending with them. And um, so trying to get, um, yeah, you know, say the business partners in our company who, who are in that, that later generation uh, to understand, okay, we got to, we have to learn how to, to communicate with the project managers differently. How do we get, so uh, get them a solution that works for them, you know, sending them a bunch of paper copies of stuff, you know, when you finish a project, FedExing them, you know, a bunch of plats and blueprints and um, delivering something on a hard drive, you know, that, that doesn't, they, they want to download link in their inbox to, for their project. They want it, they want you to go right into their um, problem solving with them, you know, so just learning how, how do we pivot our, our company and our marketing and our content and language and how we, how we interact with customers and how do we take ingredients from, from that and sprinkle it into our conversations with our customers so that we create consistency in, in, in who we are, right. And how we talk to engage our customers. And that is a slow bit of a slow process when you, you know, cause you're rooted in this one way of doing business and most of the people in the company have been trained to do business that way. So you're turning a battleship, you know, and that takes time. That's such an excellent point. And I hear it. It's a theme in the type of business that you're in, not necessarily in the, the oil and gas, but in a business that hasn't relied on marketing, has relied on the grandfather, the father, to have those long-term relationships with the folks that were their peers back in the day. And they, they developed this great business and got a great reputation, but there's turnover happening. Those folks are exiting, they're retiring, and you have a new generation of young folks. And what you did so well was talk about how this is not a marketing challenge. This is actually a business communication challenge because you illustrated really well how we're impacting the way they conduct business and, and interacting with your company. The expectation is not just to have your messaging clear, but to deliver the documents in a form that complements the way that they want to do business with less friction, less mm -hmm. hurdles. There's a lot, it's a lot of deeper application. Good job. That was, that was excellent. I, you got me, you uh, jacked up there <laughs> well it's true right you gotta so you, you you have to i heard it said so well on a on the inter podcast interview the other day is um uh, talking about better, how you, better than my podcast well not different not better okay. different okay. different um where you, you have to you know you have to to, to pick your customer you have to pick your customer up or in that relationship you know your customer's going somewhere and, and you want to, you want to benefit of being a stakeholder with them to that destination. Right. And somewhere along the way you get paid. Mm -hmm. So, but if you're going to get there with them, is it, is it better to, to get in the car and, and drive from two different places and show up and then have to figure everything out? And it, and it's like you said, there's friction, there's inefficiency or as a, as a vendor, as a contractor or service provider, isn't it better to swing by and pick them up and then you have this conversation along the way 
to the destination. And then by the time the by the time it's time to actually get the work done, you know, a lot of the hard part's done. You just now then you just got to exercise your competency because you've already built trust and you've communicated with them along the way in a way they understand. And now then, you know, trust is two part, right? Like, tr- you know, competency and character, right? So you, you can develop character with them along the way if you try to communicate with them in a way that they're receptive to. And then you just got to exercise that competency to deliver your project. Mm-hmm. And so kind of, learning teaching the team that trying to help coach the team through thinking through engaging a customer differently uh that's that's an endeavor right yeah so that's kind of where we're at you're illustrating you're illustrating a challenge and i think many of your peers when i say peers progressive thinkers in organizations who didn't start the organization, but have come along and, and they see where we need to mature to or pivot to or embrace. And so you have to lead the leaders from behind. And that's, and that's not a derog, it's not a derogatory comment. It is, it's an actual business strength that, that, leaders in your position need to develop is how to lead an organization from behind and impact the vision. And that is super difficult. Yeah. Yeah, it can be, but you, you have to lead, you know, you have to resort to the fact that you're going to have to lead through, through influence, not authority in those, Mm -hmm. in that, that's, that's your method. That's the highway, right? You, you, you can, you can pick the smooth, nice smooth surface, which is to learn how to lead through influence because you don't have the authority to do it at that totally. point. Right. So, so I'm going to interrupt you there, but so what did ROI do to support you with the influence part of your, your leadership in that organization? Well, I think that um, it, it put language around who we already were. We just didn't know how to like verbalize it. We didn't know how to get on, on paper or process. We didn't know how to process our thoughts. We didn't know how to process our, our identity. And so the, the process we went through with RO online, the questions you ask, you know, the conversations that we have with your team along the way, uh, it extracts that information. And then sometimes it just takes someone that, with the, with the gift of, of writing or, or content development or just the gift of asking the right question at the right mm-hmm. time, you know, mm-hmm. and that, and that's a skill too, right? Like that's, but having a, the, the, to be guided through that and to see that information extracted and then see it develop, um, that helps really create, um, I guess some, some outputs that are tangible that other people can hold on to. So they may not be interested in engaging that process, Mm -hmm. but there are some things that come out of that, that are, um, that are, that are tangible. And they're like, Oh, okay. Yeah. But so that's what you've been working on. That's, (laughs) that's good. So you took the complex and you, you made it simple, which we know is the hardest thing to do well is to take, you know, all this information and, you know, all this, all these things about a company and then, you know, get it distilled down to, to things that are uh, essentially consumable from the outside. And like, who is that company? And like, how are we going to figure that out? So. How did that, how did that make you feel when your, your team members finally, the light started to go on about what you were leading? They trusted you for a yeah. little bit, right? So I think, I think the big win was, you know, when we'd worked through that process over, over several months, you know, you, I think you have a, you have a ROI online has specifically, you have a 16 week roadmap to kind of that initial uh, effort. Um, kickstart, I think you call it marketing yeah, kickstart. Yeah. Yeah. Quick start. Yeah. So, you know, after 16 weeks uh, of, of, working week in, week out, you know, these, this rhythm of thinking about, and that's the other thing that, the system does is it that process puts you in a rhythm of thinking about the things you do and how you say them and how you think about them and how, you know, all those things. And, and over, over time, you're in this rhythm of thinking about how to, okay, how do I extract that, you know, information? 
so at the end of 16 weeks, uh, we had our one, our, you know, our one page, uh, content, our, uh, I'm trying to remember the, the language you use for that, but, um, since lead we had our free content, <laughs> yeah, lead generating offer. That's right. So we had our one pager and that was such a, a, a great and powerful tool. And it was a tangible, um, piece out of that work that the whole team could look at and understand because it, it's, it spoke to, you know, one of the problems we solve, which is, you know, how do you, how do you reduce the cost of, um, reworking a, a route, a pipe, let's say a right away or pipeline, you know, the, pro, the, the, the one pager really addressed, how do you reduce the likelihood of having to do rework? How do we get it right the first time? And uh, that one pager really spoke to the whole team. They're like, Hey, this is good. Like, this is right. This is exactly what we want to tell customers when we sit down with them. This is how we, you know, this is one of the edges we have on the competition is, you know, a, we're going to, we're going to be transparent and we're going to get this to the customer and say, look, take this and think about it on your next project, you know, apply it and let's, let's see how much it reduces your cost when you work with us the next time. That's crazy. So you think about uh, that conversation that that person pulled you aside and told you, look, you guys are, we like you, but you're struggling in this area. Mm -hmm. Right. And then, then having that piece that you just discussed, your team felt way more confident to be able to communicate the actual value that you did mm -hmm. offer these folks. Yep. That's a big transformation from, from insecure, trying to wing it. I hope Fred can go in and say the right words to, as a team, you have, you have a congruent message that the team knows and conveys in the, the sales support tools, the online professional look and feel, all of a sudden your team has a different confidence and a more succinct, um, yeah, empowerment. Well, and one of the things did, it did too was it, we couldn't have seen this uh, really coming into, you know, the process of engaging ROI online, trying to get our marketing up to speed. But one of the great things of going through that process was, less than a year later from, from the time we started that to a little less than a year later, uh, we had an opportunity to hire a really great business development sales guy. And had we not have done the hard work, the homework uh, of, of trying to distill that information out of our company, then, you know, I was able to, to when we hired AJ, our business development guy, you know, first thing we did was we studied the website and I, I took our brand script that we, we had worked through with you guys and I printed it and, and kind of in its raw form and I said, okay, here's, here are all the things we worked on through our marketing effort. So this is who we are and these are the things that we're good at. And this is what we want to leverage with our, you know, with the customers, with the market. And so it really fast tracked him understanding how we do business and who we want to be and how, how, when he goes and sits down and talks to a customer or he calls them to get an appointment, like he had a lot of tools he wouldn't have had uh, a year before that and much less consistency in, in, in that information, right. In that language. So that was one of the great outcomes that from this. So this is kind of that, that scalable, like one to many, like you put this energy into it, and then you get this, you get to leverage something that you didn't even know was going to be, uh, you know, something that uh, an ROI, a return on that investment that we didn't really anticipate. Totally, totally. Yeah. You know, you think, well, 16 weeks, well, can't you get a brand script done in a few days? What's, <laughs> what's the problem there? Yeah, if you're, if you're working with a leader or manager in the company that doesn't have anything else to do, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's, uh, you know, it, it's not overwhelming, but it is a commitment to get through that. You know, it, it takes mental calories to, to sit down and carve out time and uh, to meet each week. Uh, it's an investment, but it, yeah, you probably could work through it faster, but you guys, I feel like that's one of the things ROI did is you did it at a pace and it kind of at a, at a burden, a weekly burden uh, that a leader uh, can digest that he, that is manageable, right? If you make it a priority. 
Mm -hmm. Where if you sit down and try to do it in a week, I don't, I don't know that you can consume enough calories to keep your brain throttled that long. Well, we came and we did a lot of other deliverables besides just the brand script, but sure. But the, the depth of a real application of that process is more than just a, a little brand script. It's, it applies to so many other areas and you just illustrated with the, this is an organization that really hadn't conceived that it needed to have a dedicated sales force until at this point. So you, you guys are, are teeing up to scale. And so you're doing it right. You set up, you got clarity on your messaging. You got clarity on your value. You flipped your platform to where you had a professional national look and feel just like the folks that you compete against. And then you're able to start recruiting and building a team to go out and have the language to to be up to speed and be way more impactful a lot sooner. Yeah. So uh, can I give you an example of, of that, of what you yeah. just said there about scale? Yeah. So recently, uh, you know, with, uh, so, you know, to, to timestamp this podcast a little bit, you know, we're, we're kind of coming out of the thralls of, of COVID-19, right? So um, going into that, we like, I mean, the first week that we uh, realized, okay, we're gonna, all going to be working from home. The office team is all going remote. Um, at the same time that happened, you know, interest rates, especially in the real estate market, were, were up and down. You know, uh, one of the things that we saw was, okay, there's going to be a rise in demand for real estate surveys, especially commercial surveys that are going to be uh, maybe uh, refinance opportunities. And that a lot of times requires an updated uh, title survey in order to get that refinancing. Right. So we, we thought, okay, like there's going to be a rise in demand for surveying for refinancing commercial properties. I, we don't, we don't have anything right now that speaks to that, to the customer base. Right. So the reason we knew that was we had some customers in the land development civil side that were already coming to us saying, Hey, we need to get estimate. Can you get us an estimate for this? And it was like over a two week period, we saw this influx of requests for, for proposals on all these commercial properties. And, it, and we realized, okay, we need to spin up. We need a landing page for this. Like we need a link that we can send to everybody and say, Hey, we're, we're, we're in this market. We're doing this. And um, so to go to scale on that, since we already had our website built, we already had our brand script, we already had content developed. So we had a roadmap, right? Mm -hmm. And now then we need to build a service road, right? So that's not so hard once you already have, you know, everything kind of built. So we come to you guys and we say, okay, this is kind of what we want to do. We went through an abbreviated brand script for that landing page. And, and within a week and a half or two, we were 85% on, on this landing page that was marketing to a whole different sector. There's no way we could have done that in that time frame, and had it ready to send links out to customers. Had we not have already done the legwork mm -hmm. and not just in building a website, but we had the, we had the brand script, like we had the playbook mm -hmm. written mm -hmm. and then we just added some plays. Right. So yeah. there's no way we could have done that in that time frame. Uh, had we not have, have done that, that other process. So that's kind of one of those scalable, like that, you know, you, you put energy in and then, okay, Oh, Hey, there's another return on that. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's sitting there. It's really an, a, just an untapped source. And then you, you see a need and you, you bolt it on. And that's, you know, for the lack of better terms, we, we bolted on a landing page to, to market specifically to that. Exactly. Yeah. That's awesome. So you have, you had an appointment coming up and I want to be respectful of that. This has been a great conversation. Uh, Cody, people listen to this, you're going to get folks that want to hire you. They're going to go, this guy knows his stuff. <laughs> and they're going to be reaching out to recruit you. I don't know how many offers you're going to get from this podcast, Cody, but, but um, how can they get a hold of you? Well, um, I'm on LinkedIn. That's a good place to, to look. Uh, just look at, look for Cody Music, C-O-D-Y-M-U-S-I-C-K on LinkedIn. Uh, you can hit me at my uh, personal email. It's Cody at CodyMusic.com. Yeah. 
And um, so I'm kind of pivoting right now. It's funny you talk about uh, recruiting or opportunities out there. So uh, I, I'm in the actually in the process of, of exiting the organization. It's just uh, it's just time for a season of change. It's a, mm-hmm. you know Open Range is the, the company I've been working for and have been partnered with, and exiting that partnership. It's a great company, great people. They do great work. Uh, I was just, that was just time for a change for me personally, for some, uh, life lifestyle reasons. And, and just, I got ready for a new challenge. And the chickens. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. I had some chickens to grow, but, um, it, right now I'm, I'm going to be, looks like I'm going to be pursuing an opportunity and, and some professional recruiting opportunities. So going out and looking at helping other civil engineers, uh, geotechnical engineers, surveyors, mappers, uh, people in that, in that realm just trying to help them find the right opportunity that, that fits their life right now. So that's, oh, that's my new challenge. That's the, that's where I might be focused for a little while. Wow. So there may be some folks reaching out to you to help them find a new place to land. Oh, man, that's, that's one of the, one of the things I enjoyed the most about being a leader was helping people see an opportunity and then helping them figure out how, how do you, how do you get there? So what's the roadmap where you're at, break those chains. Okay. Let's be, let's have some courage and, and move into something new and fun. So what's the, can you reveal the name of this company in case someone wants? Yeah. To- so the name of the company is uh, civil search consultants, uh, Houston based, uh, recruiting company. So, um, Blake Pellegrin and Jeff Thigpen are the two guys there that started civil search. And actually I was a customer before, you know, I partnered with them. So I, I I'd used them to, to help bring some professionals, into the company. And as I worked with them, I, I really enjoyed it and had some conversations with them along the way as, as I began to, to contemplate exiting, uh, open range and, and, uh, it just worked out. So, uh, but so I'll be teaming up with Cody, your class act really, I've uh, enjoyed working with you. My team, my team loves you. You're one of the favorites there and, um, you're going to do good where you go. And I'm, I want to stay in touch and uh, value you and appreciate you. And I um, thanks for being on the ROI online podcast. You bet. Thanks for having me, Steve. It's been a pleasure.